Should the Buffalo Bills explore a trade for Colts running back Jonathan Taylor? I'm breaking that down and more today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Well, folks, we've got a lot to cover here on the podcast. Some of the stuff we're going to get into is First of all, Jonathan Taylor, the Colts superstar running back. Should the Bills be in on that? Should they be exploring a trade? We'll talk about that. Then I want to get into some of the practice updates, several players uh, missing practice, uh, some updates on how Sean McDermott is handling uh, some of the penalties during practice. I want to get a little bit, and I mean just a little bit, into the Stephen A. Smith, Stefan Diggs stuff, and then the Bills put two players on injury reserve. They signed three more. So there's, there's just a ton to get into here on the podcast. But I want to start with Jonathan Taylor. And the Indianapolis Colts have recently granted Jonathan Taylor permission to seek a trade. And it's been a bumpy ride to this point. I guess over the last seven months, he was on injured reserve at the end of last season. And then there's been some questions about his rehab. And obviously the team is not very keen on paying him a contract extension. They're looking to flip him and, you know, get a a package back in exchange for him. And it seems like anytime a big name running back becomes available, the bills are linked to them. And I don't mean like, because sources are indicating that they're expressing interest, but it feels like the, that the media just always wants to connect the bills to big name running backs, whether it's potential first rounders, whether it's, Uh, trades like with the Christian McCaffrey stuff last year, some of the big free agents that are out there, the bills are always quote unquote linked to them. And so I want to talk about this because it's the next one and you're already seeing some of the odds out there, right? From some of the sports books out there that the bills are, uh, have among the highest odds to be the next team for Jonathan Taylor. And so I want to talk about the merit of this idea and why on one hand it would make sense. And on one hand, why, it wouldn't make sense. So let's start with why it would make sense. And I think it's pretty simple. He's 24 years old. He's an absolute superstar in the NFL. He's a dynamic offensive weapon. He's been highly productive. 43 NFL games to this point. And in those 43 games, he's got 4,643 yards from scrimmage. That's averaging over 100 yards from scrimmage per game. I mean, he is a dynamic playmaker. 36 touchdowns across those 43 games. 5'10", 225 pounds, ran a 4'3", 40-yard dash, broke all the rushing records at Wisconsin, right? Super productive player uh, in the college ranks, and that translated very quickly to the NFL. I mean, simply put, Jonathan Taylor is a special running back. And if you add him to your football team, you would certainly upgrade your running back situation and you'd potentially add a dimension to your offense. I'm excited about James Cook. I'm excited about Latavius Murray. Jonathan Taylor's better, right? Jonathan Taylor is one of the best running backs in all of football, and it's appealing because he's 24 years old, right? It's not like you're talking about trading for Derrick Henry or signing Dalvin Cook, right? These guys with some some mileage on them. No, I mean, this guy is 24 years old. You feel like, on the low end, you get three great seasons from him, maybe five, right? That's probably a reasonable 
amount of strike zone in terms of where you're going to get high-end production from this player. And so one of the things that I did on my other podcast, Locked On NFL Scouting, we went through every single team and we said, okay, does it make sense for them? And the list was a lot longer than I thought, right? We got to like 12, 13 teams where you could say, you know what, kind of makes sense. And so I think there's going to be a market out there. I think someone's going to get this deal done. And for the reasons I just articulated for the Bills, it would make sense for a lot of teams. Now, why doesn't it make sense? Why would this potentially be a poor idea for the Buffalo Bills to consider? Well, I start with resource allocation. The Colts have, or the reporting out there is that the Colts are looking for a first round pick or the equivalent. So you could part with your first round pick or you can part with enough day two picks or players that I guess in their mind, it equals a first round pick. And if you're a team like the Bills, you may think to yourself, well, we're picking in the back 25% of the first round. Okay, you could just part with your first round pick and be done with it. Or maybe there's other routes that you could go. Do the Colts look at Kyer Elam as an appealing a trade chip. Would it be Kyer Elam and a mid-round pick? Does that get you Jonathan Taylor? The Colts have a massive need, and I mean a massive need at cornerback. They traded away Stefan Gilmore. Isaiah Rogers, one of their potential starters, is suspended for the season due to gambling. You could see them potentially having some interest in Kyer Elam, and that maybe that's your path, right? Kyer Elam and a fourth round pick. Does that get you Jonathan Taylor? It's worth talking about. So But that said, resource allocation, you have to give up something, right, of significance to get this player. And you also have to give this player a contract extension. You're not trading for Jonathan Taylor without the understanding that you're going to pay Jonathan Taylor, right? That's the big hang-up with the Indianapolis Colts. It's not that they don't think he, he can help their football team. Of course he can. He'd be great to have along with Anthony Richardson, who they just picked in the top five to be their next franchise quarterback. You'd love to have... Jonathan Taylor for him to lean on, but obviously they're not going to pay him. And so they're looking at this as an opportunity to trade him and get stuff back because they're not going to do it. They're not going to pay him. And Jonathan Taylor, we just talked about it. He's been unbelievably productive and he's a superstar. I'm guessing he wants to be the highest paid running back in the NFL. Well, right now that is Christian McCaffrey, who is the highest paid running back in the NFL at just over $16 million per season. So not only are you giving up significant assets to acquire the player, you're now going to allocate a large amount of cap space to a running back. And folks, resource allocation to running backs, it's just not smart roster construction. It just isn't. There is not much that you can point to in recent history that says investing premium assets in running backs is a good idea especially contracts. And so that's where you really consider this and say, you know what? That probably doesn't make a lot of sense. The Bills have enough things that they need to improve on their roster where you wouldn't look to your lowest, one of the lowest value positions and and put a bunch there. I mean, the Bills potentially need help at offensive tackle. They need a Mike linebacker. Next offseason, corner could be in the conversation. Safety could be in the conversation. Wide receiver could be in the conversation. Why would you want to give up some of your best assets for the lowest value position out there? So there's a lot of reasons why it doesn't make sense, in addition to simply how the Bills play football. Running backs haven't been the focal point of the Bills offense, and the Bills offense over the last three years has been like the best in the league, top two. However you want to measure offense, it's been elite. And it hasn't been because of running backs. They haven't been the focal point. So why do you want to take a situation that has produced great results and add this dimension that hasn't been necessary in the past to produce elite NFL offense? Now, I understand that the arrival of Jonathan Taylor could change all of that, right? It's a new dimension. He's that type of player that would be worthy of changing the way that you play offense. But why are you changing something that doesn't need to be fixed? Of course, you'd like the Bills to run the ball better, but it doesn't have to be this drastic to the point where you're going to part with the premium asset and commit this type of cap space to a running back. And now looking at recent history, the last three years, the Bills haven't really had a bell cow guy that they feed the football to. In 2022, Devin Singletary led the team 
in touches with 215. 2021, Devin Singletary with 228. 2020, Devin Singletary with 194. That is significantly less than the type of volume you would give to a Jonathan Taylor if he was on your football team. Jonathan Taylor has averaged exactly 20 touches per game for his career, which per per season is 340. The most the Bills have given to a player in the last three years is Devin Singletary, 2021, 228. This just just hasn't been part of who you are as a football team. And maybe you could make an argument that it's what you need to get over the hump, whatever you want to say there. But whether it's how the Bills play football or the resource allocation of it, that's why it doesn't make sense. So I want to spend this opening segment addressing why it would make sense, why it wouldn't make sense. And, you know, until Jonathan Taylor is traded to another team, I think the Bills are going to be linked and part of this conversation. All right, we got a bunch more to get to here. Uh, coming up. But first, I need to tell you about Bird Dogs. Bird Dogs are awesome. I love this brand. They make you look good. They have joggers. They have shorts. I love their shorts. Their khaki shorts. Their stretch khaki shorts. They're designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and give your leg a truly sculpted look. And, um, you know, everybody's high on Lululemon. Well, they do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but they fit way better. They fit way better than any regular shorts, to be honest with you, because Uh, they invented this cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so that it gives you a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. They're great for date night. They're great for being out on the golf course, just being casual. They fit for any occasion and they make you look good. They also have this anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. So check them out. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NFL or enter promo code locked on NFL for a white tech hat with any order. Folks, get yourself some bird dogs. You won't want to take them off. We promise you. All right, let's get into some of the other stuff that I have written down. I want to talk a little bit about practice from Tuesday, some updates there in terms of injuries and how Sean McDermott is handling uh, penalties, in addition to some comments here on this Stephen A. Smith stuff. Uh, we'll start with the practice report in terms of injuries. According to Joe Biscaglia, the following players did not practice on Tuesday. Quarterback Matt Barkley with an elbow injury, and I'll be honest with you, I have a level of concern about that elbow injury and you know the Bills having to get through a preseason game, and you're certainly going to want to have uh, a quarterback on your practice squad. And if you know, we don't know the extent of this injury, but he didn't practice on Tuesday. Uh, Khalil Shakir, he missed with sore sore ribs. Uh, Offensive lineman Greg Manns with a sore knee. Von Miller, of course, is still on the pup list. Terrell Bernard still not practicing with a hamstring injury. And then another new one here is Dorian Williams with a calf injury. And I don't know what it is with these Bills defensive players and calf injuries, but they keep popping up. And so hopefully that's not a a big deal and that Dorian Williams will be back soon and, you know, can hopefully play on Saturday um, against the bears because obviously reps for a rookie like that's important, but I I don't feel like there's much to be concerned with when it comes to Shakir and man's it's just soreness, but Matt Barkley's elbow Terrell Bernard's hamstring and Dorian Williams calf are things that give me a level of concern. Uh, I also thought this was interesting. Alex Brasky of Batavia daily news. He tweeted out, Uh, Following Tuesday's practice, uh, this is what he said. After the Bills' first preseason game, head coach Sean McDermott pulled players out of practice for offside and false start penalties. And then, obviously, the Bills had a crazy amount of penalties against the Pittsburgh Steelers. I think it was 12 in the first half. And then Sean was asked about penalties after practice, and you could could tell he was pretty pissed off. I mean, he he said, you know, it's something we talk about. All the time, we had issues in the first preseason game. We pulled guys out of practice for committing penalties all during the week, and then that resulted in nothing, right? Nothing got better. It got worse. You got 12 first-half penalties, just an insane amount. And so according to Alex, today on Tuesday when players committed penalties, they had to run a lap. And so 
there's obviously a huge emphasis right now on not beating yourself and committing penalties. And there's some penalties you can live with, right? Competitive penalties during a snap, okay. But pre-snap, post-snap penalties, that's the stuff that just drives you crazy. And too much of that's happening right now for this football team. Hopefully this latest approach and latest effort by Sean McDermott gets things resolved. All right, and I want to talk just very briefly about the Stephen A. Smith comments with Stefan Diggs. So I don't know if you guys saw this, but I, you know the subtexters, you, we talked quite a bit about this and getting a lot of comments on social media. St- Stephen A. Smith, ESPN, came out on I don't know, whatever show he was on and said that Stefan Diggs wants out of Buffalo. And said he had sources and, you know, Stephen A. Smith, very animated, talking about how, you know, this is really true. And then, I don't know, it wasn't too much long longer. Steve, uh, Steph Diggs on Twitter pretty much squashes this right away and says, hey, I thought I already nipped this in the bud. Um, you know, everything's good. Bill's Mafia through and through. It's, it's something along those lines. Pretty much just squashed it. And then, of course, Stephen, uh, Stephen A. Diggs, Stephen, this, it's hard to, Stephen A. Smith and Stefan Diggs. That's not easy to keep talking about. So I'm sorry if I keep running those names together. But Stephen A. Smith then kind of doubles back after Stefan Diggs says that and says, you know, look, he just really doesn't want to admit it, but he doesn't want to be there. Okay. This is nonsense, right? This is absolute nonsense. And I think this is part of what's hurting a lot of the national media, right? They don't really understand what's going on with local teams. And there's some good national media out there. I don't want to act like there isn't. But this is the stuff that is what's wrong about it. And unfortunately, I think anybody that's connected with the Bills or follows the Bills, fans of the Bills, you saw those comments from Stephen A. Smith. You rolled your eyes and you moved on with your day. You're annoyed by it, but you don't really give it you know, give much merit to it. You're not concerned. But some people do. Some people, like non-Bills fans are reaching out to me. I'm like friends of mine. Reaching out to me, like, what's going on with Diggs? I thought it was resolved. Like it's it's going to continue to be this very unnecessary talking point as long as people like Stephen A. Smith continue to say nonsense like this. And then you have the athlete go out and, and clarify And then he doubles down. I don't get it. I don't get it. I will say this, though, and and I've maintained this. I think the Stefan Dig stuff is good for now, right? It's good for now. Everything, everyone seems happy. Everything looks normal. Allen and Diggs are doing their thing. It looks great. But I maintain that there is a piece of me that whenever something doesn't go right next, right, maybe they do have another heartbreaking playoff loss. Maybe Steph Diggs' involvement declines at a certain point and they lose some games. You know, what does it look like then? What type of distraction or messaging do we get from Stefan Diggs then? So I feel good about things for now, and I don't give any merit to what Stephen A. Smith said, but I think logically you can find yourself in a position where you, you ask yourself, well, yeah, I'm good right now. Everything seems good, but what does it look like the next time there's a reason to be mad about something? And that I'm hopeful in that moment that we continue to have Stefan Diggs engaged in doing what you'd expect from a franchise leader and a cornerstone and you know one of your best football players. So that's my comments on it. I didn't want to have to talk about it, but I wanted to at least mention something here as part of a segment to address it share some thoughts, and move on, right? (laughs) Move on. So let's move on here. Let's talk about LinkedIn, and then we'll get into uh, some injury updates and three new players the Buffalo Bills added. Uh, These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. And folks, it is so easy to create a free job post on LinkedIn Jobs. And then once you do, you add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions then make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. That's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. 
Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdown NFL. That's linkedin.com slash lockdown NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, so the Bills had some injuries in the last preseason game, and it resulted in two players being placed in injured reserve, and then they signed three more. So let's talk about this. Tommy Doyle, Bills offensive tackle, Shane Ray, Bills edge rusher, both placed on injured reserve. Uh, Tommy Doyle blew out his knee, as we saw in the game. And then I'm not exactly sure about Shane Ray's injury and the significance of it. Uh, Some people that I've spoken to, indicated to me that it wasn't that serious and that we could have an injury settlement situation and perhaps later on he will sign with the Bills or another team once he's healthy. Um, But both these guys right now are on injured reserve and the indication of that is that their season is over. We know for sure it is with Tommy Doyle. I think with both guys, there's, there's a level of disappointment that you have for them, right? Both these guys, whether it's Tommy Doyle with a season ending injury last year, so back to back years, He has a season-ending leg injury. And then Shane Ray, who's been working hard to get back into the NFL, uh, gets back into the NFL, has his opportunity, and he's placed on injured reserve. It's it's a sucky situation for both of those players. And, and, you know, you just – I feel bad for both of those guys. And I think – I don't know that Shane Ray was going to make the roster, but I do think he was going to be back on the practice squad and provide the team with some really good depth in that capacity. And now you're kind of looking at Kingsley Jonathan and Cameron Klein to be your practice squad defensive ends if they can get him back on the practice squad. For Tommy Doyle, it felt like he perhaps was in line to beat out David Questenbury, where in the last preseason game, he was on the field before Questenbury. And Questenbury only played a handful of snaps before Richard Garage took over at right tackle. And so I thought there was some momentum there for Tommy, for him and Ryan Vandemark to be your two primary backup offensive tackles. And obviously this puts David Questenbury back into that conversation along with Ryan Vandemark. And so um, I think that's kind of your impact for those injuries. Now, the Bills did go out and add three players. And one of them is very interesting to me. And we'll start with that. And it's running back Ty Johnson. Ty Johnson's not like a scrub player, right? He's been on, on an NFL roster for like the last five seasons. And so let's talk about him. He's 25 years old, 5'10, 210 pounds. Really dynamic athlete, ran a 4-4, 40-yard dash, 34-and-a-half-inch vertical jump, 10-foot-3 broad jump. He's got some explosiveness to him. Been in the league since 2019, was a sixth-round pick by the Lions out of Maryland and was with the Lions for 2019 and then part of 2020, was then claimed off waivers by the Jets and then was with the Jets for the rest of 2021, all of 2020, excuse me, for the rest of 2020, all of 2021, and all of 2022. And for his career, he's got 208 rushes, 925 yards, four touchdowns, also has 86 receptions, including like over 30 in his second season with Detroit, 668 yards and three receiving touchdowns, does have 14 career kick returns, no punt returns, but does have experience on all four phases of special teams. So a guy that's been used on kick coverage, punt coverage, punt return, kick return. And like he's a he's a rosterable NFL running back. You know, this isn't a random signing. It makes me wonder about Damian Harris. This move absolutely makes me wonder about Damian Harris, who was a good player for the New England Patriots, but kind of had these lingering knee problems. And they moved on, and he found a very small market for him in free agency. He came for to the Bills for like one year, $1.7 million. He's a better player than that. I mean, even Devin Singletary got like, More than double that, if I'm not mistaken. Very small market for Damian Harris. And it makes me wonder about this knee situation. And we've he's missed time here over the last couple weeks with some knee soreness. And maybe the Bills are concerned about it and said, hey, we might need a a third running back. You've already lost Naheem Hines. Who knows if Damian Harris is going to have this lingering knee problem? And you get a guy here in Ty Johnson who prototypes pretty well as a third running back. If your number one's cook. Your number two is Latavius Murray, who I think the Bills like both of those players quite a bit. Ty Johnson is a guy with a a good special teams background that gives you some speed, that gives you some pass catching ability, and would make sense to roster with James Cook and Latavius Murray if you feel like Damian Harris is going to 
have these lingering knee issues and you're worried about availability. And from a special teams perspective, Ty Johnson offers more than any of these Bills running backs. And so I am not sleeping on this signing. I think there's a reasonable path for Ty Johnson. And all of this kind of stems back to Damian Harris and just wondering about the status of that knee and if the Bills are concerned about it because this isn't a random signing. Ty Johnson's been a rostered NFL player since 2019. And he's dresses, he plays special teams, he's got a little bit of a role on offense. You know, it makes me wonder, for sure. The Bills also signed offensive tackle Garrett McGinn. This is the third time that he has been with the Bills. It was a UDFA in 2019 out of East Carolina. Has bounced around a ton. So he's had stops with the Carolina Panthers, Jacksonville Jaguars, the Giants. Spent time in the USFL, the XFL, and three different stints with the Bills now. Uh, now, through all of that, he's only been active for two NFL games, both with the Panthers back in 2019. 6'6", 316 pounds. At ECU, he played tackle, guard, and center. I think he's a practice squad option for the Bills, obviously losing Brandon Shell and Tommy Doyle at tackle in the span of like a week or two puts them in a spot um, when it comes to um, the offensive tackle depth. And not that I think Garrett McGinn's going to make the roster, but in considering the practice squad, um, you're going to want to have three, four offensive linemen on there. And you have like Nick Broker, Alec Anderson, Richard Garage as, as those types of options. And you, you, you need more bodies. And um, especially if you wind up losing like one of those players, it wouldn't surprise me if Broker was signed to another team's 53 or even Alec Anderson. Um, and so having another option that you're getting more familiar with makes a lot of sense to have in your back pocket to fill out your roster now and potentially keep on your practice squad. The last one is Deshaun White, linebacker. Um, this is interesting, obviously. I mean, Terrell Bernard and Dorian Williams are now injured. Um, and so you can see why they needed to add another body here. Uh, Deshaun White's 23 years old. He's an undrafted free agent out of Oklahoma. Um, was most recently with the Michigan Panthers of the USFL during like their 2023 season which happens, I don't know when it happens, I guess in the spring or something like that. So he played with them, and now he's getting a chance to be on the Bills. Six foot, 218 pounds, uh, was in college, was at Oklahoma for a while, started a bunch of games, uh, but this is his first opportunity in the NFL. But I think it's more about the Bills needing another body at linebacker, obviously gaining some exposure with him and seeing if he's somebody they want to stash on the practice squad. I don't think he, I mean, it'd be very difficult for him to make the 53-man roster. But at this time of year, you're wanting to acquaint yourself with players. There's inevitable moves that are going to happen during the season, right? Guys are going to get injured. It's all fluid, right? The Bills are going to have a final 53-man roster next week, but it's never final. It changes all the time. And so getting some time with some of these guys uh, to set yourself up down the road when you need to bring in players to fill out a practice squad or even an active roster spot, it's good to do that when you have this opportunity. And I think that's the case with a Deshaun White. All right, folks. So there you have it. We covered a lot of ground today. John Taylor, Stephen A. Smith, what's going on at practice, injuries, new players, all of it. So uh, had fun going through this with you. Hope you enjoyed listening. Uh, that is going to do it for us uh, for us today. I uh, would always ask that you take a moment to make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast. We'd love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. All of that is so, so helpful. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills. And I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.